live on oops okay all right we are live on youtube where are we oops uh oh got feedback here sorry i must have must have a tab pulled up with our thing Back here, sorry, I must have. Mm -hmm. It's all right. Must have a. All right, there we go. Sorry, guys, had a little bit of a feedback loop there. Um, I am honored to bring you yet another awesome guest. We've got Dr. Anthony G. J., who is the author of Estro Generation. Um, Dr. Anthony and I spoke, I'm, I think it might have been four or five years ago. It's been a little bit, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm honored to reconnect with Dr. Anthony J. Uh, you can find him at ajconsultingcompany.com. He earned his PhD in biochemistry from Boston University School of Medicine, researching fats, hormones, and cholesterol. Obviously, many of the topics that we're going to be talking about tonight will tie in with so many of the topics we've been talking about in the preceding months. Um, Dr. Anthony G.J. here has written a fantastic book, Estro Generation. He, um, he, he's an expert, essentially. I, I guess I'd say an expert. The expert. Let's say let, the expert with a capital T of the science <laughs> behind um, estrogens and the uh, kind of I guess you would call it the chemical castration and degeneration of an entire generation of men and women due to the onslaught of uh, exposure to chemicals and plastics and foods um, and environmentally. And again, thank you very much for coming on, Dr. Anthony. It's an honor to have you here. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Yeah. Can't complain. I'm, I'm sorry. You, I think you might you might have you yourself muted there. How did this mute? It said the host unmuted me. <laughs> oh no. I'm sorry. Yeah. I think I had the tab muted. That's my bad, Doctor Anthony. That's all right. I can hear you. All right. Cool. You're good. We're good. We're perfect. Yeah, man. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad to do this anytime with you. I like your story too. Your story was interesting. It was memorable. I remember talking Thanks. with you last time, even though it's been a long time. It's been a while. It's been a while. And, you know, I think, um, I don't know, I, I really relate to your, your, your area of work. I, I mean, I totally sympathize with why you would choose such a, such a subject, but let's, let's give the audience a little bit of a background. How did you get into researching, um, estrogen and the effects of estrogen mimicking chemicals in our environment? Yeah. Well, it started with testosterone because obviously I was interested in that. Most people are, and I don't know. just the fact that our whole culture is declining. You know, I was literally talking to a guy this morning. I was doing a DNA consult. So I look at people's genetics and analyze their SNPs for various weak spots and all this. And he had like, most people maybe, maybe have one or two problems with their estrogen genes. And this guy had like seven or eight from Wisconsin too, by the way. And, uh, he uh he had gyno he had all kinds of issues issues with estrogen but he also had super low testosterone his testosterone his total testosterone was 164 and the normal range is like 250 to a thousand and by the way 250 is horrible like 400 <laughs> is horrible right 250 to a thousand but it seems like it gets every year they're like it's yeah let's, let's bring it down a little bit <laughs> yeah they've lowered it just consecutively yeah because the average male in the 1980s was 500. In the 1990s, it was 400. It's the Massachusetts aging study. You can look at the numbers. It's not age. They blame it on age. They say like, as you age, your testosterone goes down, but that's not actually that true. It goes down a little tiny bit, but our whole culture has gone down, gone down even like the 20 year old, the 30 year old population. 
And in the 2000s, the average male was in the 300s. So they just kept lowering the normal range and pretending like it was normal. And if you're below 500, you just don't have the energy. You don't have the healing capacity. You don't have the same brain performance. It changes all kinds of different things, even causes sexual apathy, meaning like you're not as driven sexually. You're not as motivated to do all kinds of different stuff. Literally like just career oriented stuff. You know, it's such a dramatic shift if your testosterone is low and people will tell you that if you know somebody who's replacing their testosterone, they'll tell you like, yeah, when I went from 200 to 800, like my whole world changed. Right. And my goal is to just have people at 800 naturally. Right. I mean, you don't want to have, like, you don't want to be putting band-aids on things and then keep exposing yourself to artificial estrogen chemicals. And so that's how it kind of morphed out of my research is looking at testosterone, seeing the decline, and then realizing there's a whole bunch of chemicals in plastics and fragrances and sunscreens in soy on and on. There's a whole bunch of categories, but they, the, all of these chemicals act together to lower your testosterone, to increase your estrogen activation. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. You, you what you mentioned just there. I mean, I've, I've known several people. I was talking to a guy recently. Um, he was, you know, th this is somebody who, had spent years in the military, so you know, exposed to various um, uh, neurotoxins, exposed to various experimental injections. Mm. Uh, anybody who was in the military in the early and mid two thousands in the U.S. or the U.K. knows what I'm talking about. Um, he had, I think, what it was that pushed him over the edge is he's, he said he had a tetanus shot, and he he had gotten a cut. And he thought, well, you know, maybe I'll go get a tetanus shot because I might have tetanus. And the hospital told him, yes, you should, you should get the tetanus shot just to be safe. He got tetanus from the tetanus shot. And after that, his life was never the same. His testosterone levels, when he checked, it was essentially, he was at like zero, right? He oh, said no. he was basically, he had like no testosterone. Mm -hmm. He was completely hypogonadal. And he said he just felt like a mess. He was like crying all the time, he told me. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, okay. I, told, I saw the guy recently. I was like, man, you're looking, you're looking Jack, like you're looking fit. You look happy. Um, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not starting to shit with me. Like you always used to like this guy used to always, <laughs> you'd see him and he's just like, there's always problems, you know, like whatever mm -hmm. he's telling you about, you're part of the problem, even though you barely know him. It was that kind of a thing. And he's like, yeah, man, I was a mess. Like I was constantly breaking down emotionally. Uh, I tested my testosterone levels they were trashed. My immune system was crashed. Um, he's like, I got on testosterone replacement therapy. Now, again, I'm not advocating this, but he's like, yeah, I replaced the testosterone. I couldn't figure out what else to do. My diet was relatively clean. I just, yeah. you know, for some reason my endocrine system wasn't working. I got on HRT and my life changed and I feel better now. And, you know, he's, yeah. he was like a yeah. different man. It was crazy. Oh, that's good. And that's one of the reasons I think modern medicine discourages HRT hormone replacement therapy because, it prevents a lot of disease and a lot of health issues, especially with age, you know, uh, and this, the system is set up as a sick care system. It, they're not making money if you're actually healthy and you're actually optimizing your health and you're actually getting off your prescription meds. Like a lot of people have depression from low testosterone and you can literally fix your depression in many situations. And a lot of guys have this. I get stories all the time where people say, look, I started doing testosterone replacement and my depression went away. And I told my doctor I cured my depression. And they say, well, let's talk about the definition of cure. Like it's not actually a cure. It's like, well, look, I had depression. Now I don't, what do you, whatever you want to pretend it is, you know, like I cured my depression. That's what they'll say. And I'm a huge fan of that. Instead of the Prozacs and the Zolofs and the Lexapro, one in every four adults in America are on SSRIs, depression serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which by the way, totally ablate your sex drive. They eliminate your sex drive as a side effect. And, you know, they have other bad side effects too. I was working with a videographer. He was 19 years old recently for some video stuff I was doing. And he had like nosebleeds all the time. And I was like, dude, you have like a vitamin K deficiency or something. What's going on? And he goes, no, no, this is just the, I'm on Lexapro. And I'm like, dude, you're 19. What? what are you on Lexapro for? And he said, well, like around final exams or something, I had a bunch of anxiety and I went to the doctor and told him, and that's just what he put me. He had no idea what he was doing with it. You know, and the problem with that is he's probably on it the rest of his life because you try and get off that stuff and then you get suicidal. It's like super difficult to get off. So now he's on the prescription, you know, he's on that train track on that railway train 
for the rest of his life and they've they've gained a lifelong customer well let's Crazy. let's talk about that i mean that's a great transition because there are many categories that you've identified of compounds that will disturb the production of testosterone compounds that will mimic the effects of estrogen in the body and a lot of these pharmaceutical drugs, and again, I mean, there are almost infinite categories of pharmaceutical drugs we could talk about, but let's talk about some of these, you know, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications. I mean, this is, this is something that's, it's plaguing my generation at least, right? Like my, uh, you know, ADHD medications when I was a kid, I think my brother was prescribed these when he was very young and this, he was a highly intelligent child. He was just a little bit, and his, te his teachers didn't like dealing with him. So they get him on the ADHD meds, right? And, um, you know, this is this is something that's plagued my generation, but also the SSRIs and the benzodiazepines. What sort of, of effects do these have on our endocrine system, on our hormone production? Um, because it sure seems like, like you mentioned earlier, they're creating lifelong customers with some of these drugs. Um, yeah. well, why oh, might yeah. people want to think twice before getting on something like you mentioned, Lexapro, Clonopin, um, some of these drugs that so many kids are on now? Well, yeah, I mean, for and by the way, does this actually mute my mic? Can you still hear me? Yeah, maybe you're using the other mic. Okay, I was curious if I'm even. Maybe I'll just keep. It sounds this up. good. It's, like it sounds good. Like, yeah, I, do any I thought I, I thought my mic wasn't working the way it should be. Um, I like to keep this mic on, otherwise my chair squeaks and sometimes, but it, if it's it's not set up, it's okay. I'm just curious. Um, you know, no problem. matter how much your chair squeaks, mine will squeak more. So I'll just uh, uh, I'll drown you down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the problem with getting on a lot of these, these particular categories of drugs is dependence, right? You get more dependent on them as you use them. And so you can't get off or you literally get suicidal. That's a huge problem. That's problem number one is you can't get off the damn things. Problem number two is the the side effects. And then problem number three is they stop working after a while, oftentimes. Now, doctors will say, no, they don't stop. They, they stop working after a while. Ask people that take them. It might take a few years. It might take decades. But again, you're on this for life. So, you know, a decade into it and they're not working anymore. And then either you got to take another one or up the dose or whatever. And then you get more side effects. And so it's not really the root cause solution. And then in the meantime, it's blocking your testosterone from working. It might not alter your testosterone in your blood. It might not block, it might not lower the total levels. It might, but usually it just blocks the effects of it. It blocks the receptors. So yeah, that's something, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because a lot of people talk about, well, you know, you, your testosterone levels aren't going to change, but there's this idea of the androgen receptor site, uh, what do you call it? A a androgen receptor site receptivity. Is that what it's called? Sure, sure. The sensitivity. Sure. Yeah, like how sensitive your receptors are. It's like having your volume turned down on your radio, right? Like you can definitely, you can have more receptors or less receptors and you can have tighter binding or weaker binding, right? And those are, I mean, they're not well understood because you can't go into a clinic and say, how many receptors do I have for testosterone? That requires a biopsy, requires a big giant research study where they're taking pieces out of people and depends on what cells they're taking. Are they taking skin cells? Are they taking muscle cells? Are they taking liver cells? Whatever. So it's like a super complicated topic, but the fact is it definitely happens. It's just a question of how much it happens and all that. It's not well characterized. Um, and, you know, these estrogen chemicals, of course, are so pervasive that literally everybody's being exposed to a bunch of these, you know, no matter what you do. I mean, there's plastics in the air, there's plastics in these masks everybody's wearing. I mean, a lot of these masks, they're literally polyester. Polyester, another name for it is polyethylene terephthalate. That's like the real name for polyester. I mean, that sounds, that sounds really sciencey to me. It sounds good. I mean, the, you've got multiple <laughs> yeah, syllables, yeah. you've got some <laughs> neo science. New here, age, like yeah. New age chemical. No, but phthal anytime you hear the word phthalate, you should have a red flag that comes up because that's as bad as BPA. You know, people have demonized BPA and rightly so. The research is really clear. It's screwing up your hormones um, and lowering your testosterone and causing infertility and on and on and on depression. Like children that has higher have higher levels of BPA in their urine have higher levels of depression. Like BPA is bad news. 
That I mean, that's fascinating because this the BPA is everywhere. I mean, this is something we I learned about maybe two thousand nine or so, mm-hmm. and. You know, it's funny because the, you, you learn about BPA and you go to the store and you're like, oh, well, look at this BPA free plastic container. Um, you know, if we start trying to abo- avoid BPA and you go to a grocery store, say, you know, if you're in California, you go to Rite Aid or, um, or Safeway and you buy containers that say BPA free, are those actually safer? Like, are you actually, are those actually any better? Not you, no, not usually. Uh- Usually they just, so the companies have switched to bisphenol S. So BPA stands for bisphenol A. And then companies just use bisphenol S, which has literally been studied and they've found it's just as bad as BPA. And if they don't use BPS, they use BPF or BPAF. There's literally like a whole alphabet of these things. And they're all just as problematic. Some are actually worse than BPA, but because it sounds better to say BPA free, they'll use the worst ones. And if they don't use anything with bisphenols, they'll just use phthalates, right? A lot of these companies, like plastic number one, is full of phthalates. And scientists used to tell people, like, BPA doesn't leach. It's okay. It doesn't leach, right? We know it's bad, but it doesn't leach. That was So initially, when they discovered it, it was terrible for people. And by the way, BPA in the 1920s was researched as a birth control. Like, it started with bisphenol A, and then they found this compound called DES, diethylstilbestrol which they prescribed women. You should look it up on Wikipedia for your listeners. Check out DES, diethylstilbestrol. Look it up. It was prescribed to women from 1930 to 1970. Millions of women took it and it caused like miscarriages. It caused all kinds of fertility issues. It caused birth defects. I know people personally that have had exposures to diethylstilbestrol. Like their mother took it while they were pregnant and they have all these birth defects from it. Because I give talks around the country and I meet people like this that say, hey, look, I'm so glad you're talking about dust because nobody else is. It's it's just like the thalidomide situation. It's like this disaster. And yet it was FDA approved. Medical doctors were writing prescriptions professionally. Everybody's trusting the doctor. He knows best. And they have all these health problems. And it's, it's a, you know, it's an artificial estrogen, just like BPA. So it was studied. It was studied BPA as a was studied control control. agent. Yep. They studied it as a birth control agent in, in the context of like, if we inject, uh, was it animal models or was it human models? No, no, humans. Oh, yeah. Who yeah, was studying this? Was this like the WHO or? Um, no, just researchers Rockefeller in the labs. Foundation or who was this? Yeah, good question. Um, let me just, ch- I, I can pull up a talk. It's fascinating. I mean, we've, we, you know, we've talked about the last couple of years, especially on some of the, uh, some of the streams over on Rockfin. Uh, we've talked about the, the Rockefeller Foundation's heavy investment, the WHO's heavy investment in fertility regulating uh, oh, yeah. injections. We can say, you know, you don't want to say the V word too too much on the streams and YouTube. You might get in trouble. But yeah, the uh, a lot of these big foundations and um, uh, the NGOs have studied you know, these you know it, it, injections that can you know completely stop fertility. But um, it's oh, yeah. amazing that these compounds, you know, DES, BPA. These yeah, are yeah. ubiquitous in our food supply. Uh, yeah. Suddenly, the last 30, I guess maybe it's almost like 50 years of bottled water becoming normalized. And, yeah. you know, I mean, this is something, you know, I've got, I've got bottled water here. I, I refuse to drink the bottled water out of uh, plastic. plastic. Same. Yeah. I, 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 there is some great mineral water out there. You can get in glass. Uh, yeah. Anyway, just filter, yeah I mean, just filter it into glass. I, I even travel with like a big stainless steel, like a 10 gallon milk, or they call those milk crate things, you know, those big giant ones. I literally just took a drill, punched a hole in the side of one of those, put a spigot on it, stainless steel spigot. And when I go traveling with my kids, I use that. I mean, every once in a while, you're at an airport or something, you have to get a plastic bottle occasionally. But I really, even at an airport, I just travel with an empty stainless steel bottle and refill it. You know, like there's ways, if you're thinking about it, the problem is most people don't recognize. And the actual scientist, I looked him up, his name was Edward Charles Dodds. He was the one that developed diethylstilbestrol. And then he, so he was the one that was studying BPA as birth control. He was like basically the designer who intentionally made it as a birth control. And then he discovered diethylstilbestrol works better. And so he switched over to that. And again, it was just 10 million cool. women that they prescribed. 10 million women. 10 million? Or that's, <laughs> that's, I mean, what, at, at the time, I mean, right now we have what, what roughly 300 million people in America. Uh, but how many, the population back then must have been less than 200 million, right? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So a huge percentage. That's big. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the thing, right? People yeah, are I mean, still- this good. I mean, we have a climate crisis, you know, clearly there are too many people. People won't stop breeding, you know. Yeah. It, right. it's, so that's- but I mean, it's, it's incredible how many different mechanisms there are to reduce human fertility and reduce population. So chemical is one of them. Others are, you know, there, there are cultural methods. There are, um, uh, yeah, ideological methods to reduce population, but this this chemical castration and chemical sterilization seems to be something that you know there's there's a lot of money in studying this stuff isn't there yeah and, and i was talking to a, a farmer from maine i was up bear bear hunting in maine in the state of maine and uh, i was at a bar watching red sox games a few years ago telling him about my book telling him about this information he goes and, I, and of course these things cause infertility and he's like well that's okay that's good we need less humans and i was like well you know it's interesting the polar bears, they did a study with 11 polar bears in northern Alaska, and they're becoming infertile from these chemicals. Every single one of the polar bears that they studied had parabens and phthalates in their fat cells. That's all they were looking for. They weren't looking for 20 chemicals. They were just looking at those specific ones. And those trigger infertility. And it's, and he's like, oh, yeah, that's real. Like, all of a sudden, the polar bears are at risk. And he took it seriously, which is so stupid. It's so but, sad. I mean, it, it kind of shows you. I mean, it, it, it really is. They're... Like I said a minute ago, you have you have kind of a chemical assault on fertility, but also an ideological assault where it's like yep. we assume, you know, and I made a cheeky joke a minute ago. Obviously, I don't believe that humans are bad and we need to reduce the population. I think that's an insane psychopathic worldview that unfortunately is you know, kind of taken for granted, especially among the scientific community. And I wanted to ask you this. I mean, when you were studying um, it, it, and and um you know obviously you went through the university system and you got a phd did you come upon a lot of this malthusian type thinking among academia and or did you at any point buy into it? i mean i know personally I, I really especially in you know high school and maybe my first two years of college i really kind of adhered to a lot of this mm-hmm. thinking oh there are too many people the world is obviously overpopulated we're so bad humans are bad um, yeah, did you come upon a lot of this in, in academia and, or even maybe adhere to these type of worldviews? No, and I didn't come across the overpopulation issue, con, uh, conversation very much, but what you hear, what I came across constantly was statins are amazing, lower cholesterol is the ultimate healthy mark, you know, health marker and all this nonsense. And by the way, your testosterone is made from cholesterol. So these vegans and vegetarians that have a total cholesterol of 120, they always have low testosterone. Men and women, by the way, we haven't even talked about women having low testosterone. That's a huge problem too. It's not as well studied, but it's a huge problem. I talk to women all the time. Like one of my clients yesterday had a total total testosterone of six. And I like to see people over 50. Like I'd like to see women over 50 because that has a huge impact on their health and their well-being and their emotions and all this kind of stuff, just like we're talking about with men. Um, and, and by the way, a lot of blood test companies for women, they'll say the normal range for women's testosterone is zero to 100. And so if you go in there and you get a when zero, did, this begin? When did, did that change recently? I mean, that sounds, uh, it depends on the company. Like some of them say five to 50, some of them say seven to 70, some of them say zero to 70. It depends on the company. And again, a lot of it has to do with money, right? Because if women's testosterone is in the toilet, and they think that that's okay, what they do is they start groping for prescription drugs and trying all kinds of different ones. And it's, it's a crisis because your health, once your health sinks down into that kind of depth, you'll pay money. You'll put up a bunch of money, right? Money is not an issue. I need to be healthy. And unfortunately that's where they want you in those situations. And so when I was doing my PhD, I ran into a lot of that kind of thing where like statins are amazing, you know, uh, gluten is not a problem, (laughs) like whatever. A lot of the conventional stuff, grains are the ultimate health food. And honestly, that's one of the reasons I shifted my entire, you know, outlook on this stuff. And I started doing DNA consulting for people and looking at genetics and optimizing people because people, some people handle gluten fine, right? Like there's definitely a lot of variation between people's ability to deal with dairy and people's ability to deal with estrogen chemicals. There's a lot of genes there and on and on brain, you know, Alzheimer's and brain performance and carbs and ketones and all this kind of stuff. And I became interested in that because they were laughing at this idea that we can be gluten sensitive. And I was clearly gluten sensitive. Like I didn't have celiac. 
But I noticed a massive difference when I got off gluten, how much better I felt. I got rid of my acid reflux. I got rid of my hemorrhoids. And they told you, you can't get rid of hemorrhoids. They told me, you can't get rid of hemorrhoids. And I got well, rid of mine. Forever. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about this. I mean, that's, yeah, that's kind of drugs, like right? someone you could never get rid of acne. Is you're just like that there forever. <laughs> right. You just you got exactly. acne forever. You're so just going to have, you never yeah. stop doing it. It's insane. Yeah, get rid of the seed oils. And yeah, get rid of the sugar. You'll, your acne will go away. But it, you know, it just basically called into question all of this medical nonsense that that a lot of the doctors are indoctrinated into. Because there's good science out there, but then there's also a bunch of nonsense science. I mean, hopefully in the last two years, people have woken up to this. If they haven't, they just haven't been paying attention or they're listening to the wrong news sources. The 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 news sources that are literally just propaganda and not actually news. And people need to move away from that and start paying attention to reality because this has been a problem before. I wrote about this in my book. You probably remember I had a whole chapter on the nonsense within peer reviewing and the soy and how they've pushed soy and pretended like soy is this amazing health thing, even though it's terrible for people. Like, I, well, look, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get into that a little bit because I mean, this is something we've been, we've seen, I mean, over the last three years, we've seen the rise of the, uh, the soy face. I mean, it's become a meme, right? Like this, oh, <laughs> Yeah, you see this everywhere. This it's it's the the, the new male has a specific aesthetic. Uh, he has a specific body type, and he has a specific uh, diet type as well. And uh, you know, soy has has become almost a. I mean, at least among people who watch this channel, it's definitely become a meme. Mm -hmm. So you know, you obviously were a little bit ahead of the curve on that. What is soy doing to us, and why have we seen? The rise, especially over the last, you know, three, four, or five years, of the stereotypical soy boy, the soy yeah. male, blue male. Well, a couple things. I mean, <clears throat> number one, let's say that you're drinking out of plastic. All your liquids are in plastic. Your mayo, your ketchup, all this junk food people are eating. And then, let's say that you're not filtering your water, so it's coming right out of the sink, which is coming in a million plastic pipes and Let's say you're putting on sunscreen all the time and you're using all kinds of personal care products with all kinds of fragrances that are petroleum based that are acting like estrogen in your body. And then you throw in some soy. You're not going to notice that much of a difference, right? Let's be honest. You're, you're pretty much washed out in estrogen and you're throwing a little bit more estrogen at your system. You may or may not see a difference in a scientific study. One thing that all researchers agree, though, soy acts like estrogen. Everybody agrees with that. Like, there's no debate about that. And most guys, when they hear that, that's enough for most guys. Most guys are like, look, I don't want to dose up with a bunch more estrogen. And they've, the studies, they've done studies with over 100 food items in Canada looking just purely at phytoestrogen, plant estrogen. How much estrogen is in plants? We, they looked at broccoli. They looked at beans. Hundreds of things, right? They looked at kale, whatever. And every food item was under 1,000 units of estrogen except for soy and flax. And soy and flax were over 100,000 units. It was basically just this gigantic, everything's under a thousand and then soy and flax over a hundred thousand, right? It's not even like the same discussion. It's not even the same ballpark. So, and again, everybody agrees with like scientists that actually are being honest. Of course, they'll say, look, it acts like estrogen. And then they'll say, yeah, but it's a good kind of estrogen or we need a little estrogen. I was going to bring up the, you know, the devil's advocate where it's like, look, these are lignans. I mean, they, with, with, um, yeah. uh, with flax, says, oh, these are lignans. Mm -hmm. They're not so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they will block estrogen receptors and prevent actual estrogen mimickers from hitting the receptors. Well, what would you say to that kind of apologetics yep. from the soy, yeah. soy the pro soy crowd? So the pro, uh, yeah, flax has the lignans and soy has got the isoflavones. But what, what they've done, like Michael Greger, for example, what he argues basically is so there's two receptors for estrogen, right? There's estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta. Like with testosterone, it's super simple. There's just one receptor, it binds, it's easy. But estrogen is more complicated. And this alpha receptor um, is problematic. Like you don't want to be activating the alpha receptor outside of the womb, right? During sexual development, sure, activate it. And then after that, you shouldn't be activating your alpha receptor. You're going to increase breast cancer. For men, you increase prostate cancer, you increase depression, postpartum depression, all kinds of blood clotting issues, all kinds of problems, right? Um, varicose veins. I mean, the whole thing. You don't want to be activating your alpha receptor. Um, 
outside of sexual development. And then the beta receptor, on the other hand, is a good receptor. Like that's protective against prostate cancer. It's protective against breast cancer and on and on and on. And so having some level of natural estrogen is actually very important. It's beneficial as long as it's activating the beta receptor. And as long as your testosterone is also high, like the ratio between testosterone and estrogen matters. That's super important. It's so like irrespective of how much estrogen you have, as long as you have a really high level of testosterone, as long as that ratio is reasonably good, you're usually pretty good. But then you throw these fake estrogens, like these plant estrogens. And the argument is, oh, it activates the beta receptor. So Michael Greger, he likes to pull up this one study where it shows that. And he picks out one figure and he blows it up. But ironically, that exact paper that he uses to show that soy activates the beta receptor, the good receptor, the next figure shows that it activates the bad receptor, the alpha receptor. And then the authors basically concluded like, well, we don't really know what's going on. It depends on the certain cells that you pull out of your body. Like some cells, it's good response. Sometimes it's a bad response. And it honestly depends on the person and their genetics and there's all this variability. So in other words, it's way too much risk to say that soy is good for you. But, you know, you're not, they're not going to say it's bad for you either. And then you start looking at the funding behind a lot of these studies that are pushing it as a positive thing. And I would argue that it's not a good thing. It's a bad, it's, it's too risky. It depends on the person. Yes, there is some nuance there. But the fact that we have so much estrogen already, and then you're adding another estrogen, and it might activate the bad receptor, it might activate the good one, it probably activates both. My opinion is it activates both. Right, and then it's not just one. like another extra estrogen. It's like a consistent estrogen as a main food staple, replacing other foods that. I mean, you're you're offsetting <clears throat> the, the benefits that you could be getting from fat soluble vitamins. You mentioned like a lot of people vitamin K two deficiency, right? Vitamin A deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. These fat soluble vitamins that people are displacing with these, uh, you know, mass produced soy corn based. Uh, fake protein products that mock meats yeah. and stuff like that, which are, you know, it's right. basically industrial dog food. It's kibble. Yeah. And it's, not, it's, it's worse than that actually, because it's full of lectins and stuff. A lot of these seeds, like if you think about plants, like if a deer walks out into a field to eat the spinach leaves, it's not that big of a deal. The leaves just grow back. So they don't put a lot of toxins into their leaves. But if a deer goes out into a field and eats the spinach seeds, that's the offspring of the plant. So of course they put a bunch of toxins in there. To protect them from being eaten so the deer gets a stomach ache or whatever it's damaging to the deer so it protects the plants from being eaten because the plants can't get up and run away it's the whole lect the whole category is called you lectins. look at a lot of the seeds that come from grasses you know they they'll they'll survive the digestive tract of the the, the ruminant which is you know mm -hmm. you got a four chamber digestive tract mm -hmm. and well in fact we we all right so there's certain seeds here like um if you want to sprout certain seeds, you put them through your goats, you put them through your sheep, you put them through your cows, you collect the manure and that manure is going to activate that seed because it survives the entire digestive tract due to these anti-nutrients and these compounds, like you mentioned, lectins and whatnot, that make it indigestible to the animal. It's not absorbed or digested by the animal, but once it deposits it into the ground with its feces, it becomes activated and if it has a, enough moisture for a period of time, it's going to grow into a tree or it's going to grow another leguminous right. plant. So right. yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right there. Like it, it, it gets protected and those animals don't digest it. Exactly. Or you want to be grinding them up and then just eating loads of them. And that, and soy is in that category. It's a seed. It's like, that's why seed oils are so problematic, right? Like, of course they're going to argue until they're blue in the face that they're good for you or whatever, because there's a ton of money behind that and it's cheap to produce them. And, but you have to be skeptical of that kind of stuff because, again, anytime you, anytime you follow the money back, you know, it starts to open up this picture of like, I mean, it's, it's one of these merchant to doubt situations where you find a bunch of studies where soybean oil is bad for you, soybeans are bad, soy is acting like estrogen, and then you throw in one study with it that argues that it's good, and everybody goes to that, and, and, and all of a sudden the, muddy, the water is so muddy, everybody supposedly disagrees, and all of a sudden we have 45 percent obesity <laughs> you know what i mean so. yeah yeah so I mean, well the seed oils i mean with this, this is a great tie-in good transition because you know i think uh you know, the seed oils have their their foot in both worlds as far as uh estrogen mimicking chemicals direct obesogens <laughs> you know i mean these are uh 
you 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 track the rise in consumption of seed oils, the decrease in some in consumption of animal based fats, and it directly tracks with the rise in obesity in the Western world in the United States, also the rise of uh, the increase in cancers. So seed oils, polyunsaturated fats, is it just the uh, PUFAs, the polyunsaturated fatty acids in there, or is there something more that we're seeing that your work may dovetail into as far as we, you know, increase in cancers, increase in obesity from the rise in consumption of these seed oils? Well, just think about how they're stored, right? I mean, they're stored in plastics and, you know, water, you get some, you definitely get leaching from plastics into water. People like to say that you don't, you definitely do, even at room temperature. People say, oh, I don't I don't heat up my hot coffee in plastics, but I'll drink water out of water bottles. You still have plenty of leaching into your water bottles. It certainly accelerates the leaching. You get more plastic substance, more estrogen substance into your liquid if you're heating it up, but you get plenty at room temperature. But then if you throw an oil in there, you get way more leaching, right? Because plastics like estrogen floats on water, testosterone floats on water. They're made from cholesterol, right? And by the way, like a building block for cholesterol is saturated fat. So doctors oftentimes try and demonize saturated fat purely because it raises your cholesterol like five or 10 points. It doesn't matter for your health. It's actually good for your health to do that. But as a culture, they've tried to demonize that. So it, it goes saturated fat, cholesterol, testosterone. That's how the building block goes. That's the pathway. Sat fat, cholesterol, testosterone. And so, of course, they've tried to demonize both cholesterol and saturated fat. And what's that, what's that done for vegans and things? Well, it's just tanked their testosterone, like I mentioned before. And so number one, these animal fats are good for you because they give you the building block for cholesterol, which gives you the building block for testosterone. You're saturated, you have saturated fat. Like animals have saturated fat. That's why when you eat animal fats, it's saturated fat. That's the same stuff as your body. When you eat these plant fats, there's a lot of you know processing power your body has to deal with. It's just like fiber. It's just like all this photosynthesis machinery, your body has to deal with all this nonsense to assimilate into your body. Whereas if you just eat meat and animal fats, it just goes right into your system. It's a very smooth transition into your system. But then again, the seed oils, you start throwing them in these plastic tubs and these plastic barrels and these plastic, plastic, plastic. Well, because oil and these plastics, these estrogen chemicals that leach out are hydrophobic, they float on water. There's way more leaching in the plastics with oils. So you get a lot more of these chemicals. So then you're just doubling your dose of these chemicals. And then you think you're studying the fats, but you're really studying a lot of these chemicals that are leaching into the fats. Um, and that, of course, muddies the research, right? Because then they can study olive oil or something that comes from a fruit. It's not really a seed oil. It's a fruit oil. And they're going to find problems with it because they're storing it in plastic. And then there's going to be other studies where they just use olive oil and glass and they don't find those problems. And then it's all kinds of mess. And the researchers just aren't smart yeah. enough to recognize that. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the olive oil is the water down in that water. Yeah, they yeah. they cut the olive oil. You want to talk about that a little bit? Because, I mean, I, I, I think that olive oil can be a great food, right? Even, uh, you know, coconut oil, olive oil, uh, well, in the red palm oil, in theory, also. I think there are issues with the production of red palm oil. I mean, I've seen the, the plantations, but there are, you know, there are there are small farms who produce red palm oil without clear cutting um, and stuff like that. So yeah, there, there, there are certain plant fats that are not so bad. They all tend to come from fruits, right? Red palm, coconut, avocado, not yeah. seeds, right? Exactly. They're not peanut oil. They're not corn oil. Um, but what might be some of the problems that you're going to see with contamination with something like, say, uh, olive oil on the market? Oh, yeah. yeah, they just illegally put canola oil in a lot of them just to save money. You know, and it's... A little bit on a similar topic, a little bit off topic, maybe, but the president of the American Heart Association several years ago, I mean, like five plus years ago, he came out with a quote unquote research study. It was actually just an opinion piece that he wrote, but he called it, it was in his, his own American Heart Association journal. So he, they could couch it as a study. And he basically said that coconut oil is terrible for you because coconut oil is a saturated fat. Therefore, it raises your cholesterol. Therefore, it's bad. And I had to go on all these podcasts because, again, this is my expertise. And I had to say, look, it's nonsense. Coconut oil, by the way, the fat in there is like 10 carbons long, right? It's 8 to 12 carbons long. It's very small fats. They call it medium chain triglycerides, but it's actually pretty much small, tiny little fats. The fats in our bodies and cows and deer and elk and moose and dogs, it's, it's more like 16 to 18 carbons long, all of it. 
And so when you eat coconut oil, you can't store that as fat. Those are little tiny 10 carbon fats. You either have to burn it as energy. So you're teaching your body to burn fat, real clean energy, or you basically get diarrhea because you can't handle it quick enough. You're taking too much and you're just blowing it out of your system. You're not going to get fat. You're not going to have all kinds of health problems with COVID. So I had to go and debunk all this stuff. And then literally the year after that, the president of the American Heart Association died of a heart attack. What was his cholesterol though? I was probably super low. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So now there's something that I've covered over the years. And um, you know, well, the last two years we've been taking a different uh, approach out of necessity and uh, you know, enjoying talking about, talking about different topics as well. But um, yeah, the, when you look at the studies on heart attacks, just as many people get heart attacks with low cholesterol as with high cholesterol, but there seems to be a difference in survival rates <laughs> between people with low cholesterol and high cholesterol. Um, it, it seems to me from the research I've done and from looking at many studies, and of course, you know, you're, you're somebody who knows much more about this than I do. Am I, am I correct in the assertion that, uh, first of all, low cholesterol doesn't protect against heart attacks and just as many people die uh, or I'm sorry, just many people get heart attacks with low cholesterol as high cholesterol. But secondly, it seems like when you look at the survival rates, high cholesterol it's better for you. really has a protective effect against death when somebody does get a cardiac event. Am I, am I wrong in saying that? No, well, you're right, but it's not really high cholesterol. It's just normal cholesterol. <laughs> they just call it high cholesterol because the they average person is about 200, but they consider 200 too high. And so they would say high cholesterol, whatever, but I would say it's actually totally normal. As long as your total is below 300, I consider that actually optimal. I, the optimal range is 180 to, 180 to 280 on your total cholesterol. As long as you're in that range, I couldn't care less about your particle size and all this, all, all this nuance. Unless you have some weird genes, you know, some people have LPA genes and some genes where there's some nuance. And of course I look at that, but a lot of people are getting worked up at then their total cholesterol is 250. That's a phenomenal number. Like that's literally optimal. I can show you graphs and all of this. And, and I, I, you know, there's a study with 12.8 million people. If people just Google the study again, you just search 12.8 million people. The study is called total cholesterol and all cause mortality. Um, if you use those search terms with the number 12.8, you'll look at figure, uh, figure two, and it's the bottom right graph in figure two, it shows that exact data that you're talking about. You know, it shows the all cause mortality. So they're just looking at death by any cause. They're not just looking at heart attacks. They're looking at cancer deaths, literally everything. And the optimal range where, where you're not gonna die the most is when you have nice high levels of cholesterol. It's, again, it's not high, it's just normal, but they'll call it high, right? I mean, and and it seems like every few years they lower the threshold. Right. The, the, the threshold drugs. they lower the, you know, the, the profits the from range. companies on statins <laughs> seem to increase directly proportionally. Yeah, no, for sure. That's, that's kind of a wake up call for a lot of these people that don't understand this is, you know, you show them that, that actual data on cholesterol and what the good range is. And then you show them the normal ranges, but given the, the lab studies and it doesn't coincide at all. Like the research and the actual lab tests don't coincide because they want you to think that your test, your cholesterol is super high so they can give you drugs. I mean, again, it's money motivated. It makes sense. But it's frustrating because, you know, you're actually healthier with high levels of cholesterol. And again, I'm not, it's actually not high. It's just normal. So, all right, low levels of cholesterol, high levels of cholesterol, something that I've noticed and kind of some points that I bring up with, um, especially with our vegan friends. I mean, we're running sort of a vegan rescue operation here over the last few <laughs> years. You know, we, uh, mm -hmm. we take in estranged vegans who are at the end of the line, reach their end stage veganism. We help them to recover. We help them to recuperate. And we help them to not only get their health back, but get their, you know, uh, get their perspective back in line, which sometimes becomes very skewed. Uh, when you look at studies on low cholesterol and like behavior and criminal uh, convictions, is this is this something that you've uh, that you've covered or looked into, like the association no. between, like, okay, so like low cholesterol is highly associated with violent crime, hmm. uh, and impulsive behavior. So I mean, this is and and this would direct directly correlate with a lot of your wonderful work on, um, on on estrogen levels because of course low cholesterol 
you're not having the building blocks to produce hormones, you know, progesterone, mm -hmm. testosterone, uh, you need cholesterol. That's the building block of this. So yeah, I mean, it's a good segue into how, how does cholesterol, how does your cholesterol level affect hormone levels, right? Now we've talked about estrogens, estrogen mim mimicking chemicals. And, uh, you know, I'd like to get into another, uh, a little bit later, perhaps the list of different categories of estrogen mimicking chemicals that are out there that affect our health. But, um, how, how does cholesterol affect hormone production directly and indirectly? And how should we look at cholesterol as a hormone? Should we look at cholesterol as something that's bad and dangerous, going to clog your arteries like a, you know, like a dirty sink? Or is this something that perhaps has another uh, function in the body as far as hormone production? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's definitely the most important building block for these hormones. You know, the real root cause of plaque in people's arteries is inflammation. And if you pay half attention to the research, you'll recognize that right away. This whole spin on cholesterol as being the bad guy is just completely money driven. It's complete nonsense. And by the way, if your cholesterol gets high enough, if your cholesterol is like 400, and sometimes people do have legitimately super high cholesterol and that is a legitimate problem. The reason it's a problem though, is because if it's that high, if it's 400, right? Then it stays in your body such a long time, your body can't get rid of it. It starts reacting with oxygen and becomes oxidized and the oxidized cholesterol starts damaging your arteries. And so in other words, it's not really the cholesterol. And even in that case, it's just the inflammation from the oxidized cholesterol, just like oxidized seed oils are problematic, right? They're called polyunsaturated fats. Unsaturated fats have a lot of potential for oxidation, potential for reacting with oxygen. That's basically the definition of unsaturated. It means it has sites that are available for saturation, for hitting it with the chemical bonds. It's very reactive. So like plant fats, seed oils in particular, are much more prone to becoming oxidized and prone to becoming inflammatory and damaging your arteries compared to saturated fats, which are super stable. You can't hit them with oxygen and oxidize them easily. Uh, so again, you can have problems with high cholesterol if it's really, truly, outrageously high. But if it's not outrageously high, you actually want to be a little bit high on the levels of cholesterol because it's a building block for sex hormones. Yeah, very, very well said. So what are the what are the uh, most offensive sources? I mean, we've talked about plastics, right? Yeah. Um, and they're everywhere, right? I got a plastic keyboard. I'm touching a plastic mouse right now to mute and unmute myself. I'm speaking into a, a microphone that's made out of 90% plastic. Thank God I'm drinking out of a, a bottle that's made of glass. But of course, on the bottom of the lid, what do you have? You got a little bit of plastic there. So, I mean, it's unavoidable, right? There are plastics everywhere. They're in our clothing. Um, what are the... What, where can people start, right? I mean, we understand that there is this chemical onslaught we are being essentially chemical, chemically castrated, um, chemically lobotomized in many ways. And, you know, it doesn't just affect males, it affects females as well. So I guess maybe there's, we need a better word than chemical castration. It's more like a, you know, general chemical. Well, the scientists, yeah. Scientists use these fancy terms like gonad deformations and they say male feminization um, for men, like, because, Oh, you I mean, that's, that seems a little bit gender binary for, for <laughs> you know, modern science. Yeah, isn't that funny? I mean, it's they've tried to shift away from that, but that's the fact, right? Like, if it's lowering testosterone, that's a form of feminization, right? You're feminizing. And so some scientists are still being honest, and they're still using that term. Like, if you look up atrazine and feminization, you'll find all kinds of studies with that. Atrazine is a herbicide that they're spraying. Second most used herbicide in North America, by the way. And glyphosate's another one that acts like estrogen. When I wrote my book, I wasn't super convinced, so I didn't include that all that information. But after I wrote my book, the research has gotten actually more clear on glyphosate. And the reason I didn't include it in my book is because atrazine, if you look at the molecule, this particular pesticide that acts like estrogen in your body, it looks like estrogen. Like it's very obvious that it would, it would act like estrogen, right? And if you have a male frog, and you put them in 200 nanograms per deciliter of atrazine, it'll turn into a female, right? And that's where the Alex Jones gay frog thing came from. But it's not a gay frog. It's just a female frog. You turned it into a female. You feminize it. Um, and by the way, the legal allowable 
limit for Americans for drinking water is 3,000 nanograms per deciliter of atrazine. So a frog at 200, you change it from a male to a female. In our drinking water, it's legally allowable to have 3,000. Um, but glyphosate, I wasn't as convinced this whole Roundup, the chemical, it looks like glycine. It looks like an amino acid. It doesn't look like estrogen. And so I, you know, I just couldn't get my head around this. There's some research kind of indicating, but again, the research has gotten clearer and clearer. And so finally I realized it's because gly glyphosate can bind with metals like calcium and magnesium and zinc. It's called a chelator, C-H-E-L-A-T-E-O-R. It chelates metals, it sticks to metals. And when it does that, it can, you can have two, glyph glyph uh, two Roundup molecules right next to each other. And now it suddenly starts looking like estrogen. You see? And so then it kind of makes sense to me that, yeah, glyphosate, Roundup, like these pesticides are acting like estrogen. Uh, soy, we already talked about. The other giant category we haven't even mentioned is personal care products, like like your soaps and your sun uh, your sunscreens and your shampoos and all these crazy fragrances people are using. That stuff is riddled with estrogen chemicals, estrogen mimicking chemicals. And the people are using like 10 of these a day, 10 personal care products a day. It's insane the numbers of, of personal care products. And it's insane how much they impact the blood levels of these estrogen chemicals in your body. So, I mean, right there, that there's so many categories of products that people are using. I mean, the soaps, the, uh, the, the gel soaps. I mean, how about the hand gel? The last two years, all yeah. these, I mean, yeah. you go into the freaking bank and like right next to the bank teller, there's a, there's a big thing of the hand goop. Hand sanitizer. And you smell this stuff and it's just, it, it smells yeah. like, like flowery chemical nonsense you know to, to me it smells awful maybe when i was a kid like i remember lysol like mm -hmm. like if something was maybe, maybe it was like in high school you like smoke some weed in your room and you smell some, you spray some lysol around or something to your parents don't find out but it's like i mean I, 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 uh, there's so many of these things and mm -hmm. so many products yeah. and, and you know i mean really personally yeah. what we've come to do over the last i mean we, we kind of started learning about this stuff maybe about 13 years ago we just kind of stopped using all these things mm -hmm. and you you know you realize like things like uh you know vinegar or apple uh, apple cider vinegar or just straight up vinegar is a fantastic cleaning product for your your, your kitchen right i mean you know you you're cleaning your floors or something you use a little bit of water and maybe some i mean even essential oils what about that like mm -hmm. things like tea tree right tea tree um uh what else is there that's really Citrus popular lavender ones. Are these the same? Mm. And are these really something that people should be concerned about? The uh, lavender oil, tea tree oil, these also technically are estrogen mimickers as well, right? And there are a lot oh, of yeah. natural products. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know researchers have studied lavender in particular, and they say for sure it acts like estrogen. And it's enough. And I've seen the research. It, it acts like estrogen. It's an estrogen mimicking molecule. It almost is on par with natural estrogen. Like if you look at the actual receptor binding in the New England Journal of Medicine study with lavender, it's like the same amount of activation on the estrogen receptor as actual estradiol, you know, as actual estrogen. So I definitely avoid lavender. Again, we've got enough estrogen. Go with citrus essential oils and go with whatever. You know, like there's a ton of other ones if you want to do, use them. I literally use them myself. Like I make, I make my own soda and I just put a little stevia in some water. I have one of those bubblers. I just charge it up with CO2, put a drop of citrus, like orange, uh, essential oil in there, orange peel essential oil, some kind of essential oil with citrus flavor, and it's it's awesome. Um, what about like? Uh, I mean, look, I I'm 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 kind of rude. I don't really care too much about Royan deodorant. You know, mm -hmm. deal with it. Deal with it, my friends uh -huh. and family. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll take a little bit of like uh, peppermint oil or something. That's one that you can peppermint yeah. oil. Good. I don't know. Is there, are there any are there any negative effects of pepper? Well, I'll throw that on my hand, throw it under my mm -hmm. armpits if I'm getting super stinky, if I'm sweaty. Yeah. Um, well, that it works. Magnesium, easy. magnesium, is the, the ultimate. You know, like one of the reasons they put aluminum in deodorant is because it tightens up your pores and it actually works pretty good. The problem is, it's freaking aluminum. It's a heavy metal. It's technically a heavy metal, and uh, and it does go through your skin. They, you know, they they used to laugh at that idea. That I I used to talk to scientists ten years ago. And they would say, no, it doesn't go through your skin. Because I, I asked, I used to question this stuff and say, like, well, doesn't aluminum in your deodorant cause potential problems where it can build up in your brain and build up in your body? 
And they say, no, 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 it's an inert metal. That's a joke. You know, there's no way it could. And now they've actually done the studies and they find it does, in fact, build up in your body and it does go through your skin. Like even using users of deodorant have more aluminum in their system in a dose responsive way, meaning like if you stop using deodorant, it goes down. And if you use more deodorant, it goes up. But magnesium does has the same properties as aluminum, but it's just nothing but benefit, beneficial, right? So you can get some like magnesium deodorant or some fragrance-free magnesium deodorant and make it yourself or uh, magnesium lotion or something like that. And that's probably a really good idea too, if you want to go that direction. But the conventional deodorants with all the fragrance and stuff, people need to move away from that stuff. They even, And sunscreens too, like I said, like they've done a study after I published my book, right? And... So it's not in my book, unfortunately, but there's a, there's 400 research studies in, the, in my book. So it's well referenced and it's pretty easy to read. So if people want like really interesting studies, they should go there too. But again, that's after, the book is called Astro Generation. And where can people get the book just to throw this out yeah. to the audience? Oh, it's all over the place. It's on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and all the usual kind of places. I've got the ebook and the audio book that I read myself. And I got the, the hard cover and the soft cover. But after I published, and appreciate the plug, by the way, <laughs> but after I published it, they came out with a study on sunscreen and they literally just did one application of sunscreen. Okay. And the, and the sunscreen, the worst chemical in there is called oxybenzone. It's also called benzophenone three, but oxybenzone is the usual term that they use. O-X-Y-B-E-N-Z-O-N-E. Just that benz, like scary. I think of benzene and, and yep, benz. Yep, yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's the same shape as an estrogen right off the bat. And then um, one application of sunscreen, seven days later, people's blood levels of oxybenzone were still above the government's own safety limits. And that's the government's safety limits, which are outrageously high, right? We talked about the frogs turning female at 200 and then the legal drinking water is 3000. It's like that where the, if you're above the safety limits, you're way too high because they don't care if it acts like estrogen. All they care about is if you're getting cancer or something like that. And so they set Isn't the safety like, limit. It's like a protracted time period. So we care if you're getting cancer within like six within weeks. Within quick. Yeah, exactly. That's a huge problem, right? The fact that they do these studies on six week time scales and then it causes cancer five years later and nobody cares, right? Because you can't prove it so they just pretend like it never happened yeah and again like the last two years we've seen some examples of that right everybody being mandated certain medical treatments where uh you know we have seen cancers increase dramatically in a short period of time there have been doctors that have observed uh highly aggressive you know stage three stage four cancers developing within weeks which is unheard of after being treated with certain you know medical treatments that are exper experimental that were being gaslit forced well, not forced, but, you know, almost forced uh, into taking. So uh, you're just, just throwing that out there as well. Like, this, you know, this is this is a pattern. Yeah. And heart attacks are on the rise like crazy. Um, but exactly. And then the problem with these estrogen chemicals is they're not really that toxic. Right. They don't kill your cells because they act like estrogen. So your cells are like, oh, yeah, it's just estrogen. No big deal. So then they set the toxicity super high and they say, no, it's not toxic. So you're fine. Like that's the problem with BPA way back in the day. They said, no, no, it doesn't leach. And then they found out, yes, it does. And then they said, no, it's not toxic unless you take like a kilogram of it. And then they realized, oh, whoops, it causes infertility over this longer time span. And it causes all these other problems. Um, and we're still kind of in some of the denial phase with a lot of these other chemicals because people desperately want to use plastic. It just costs so much more money to use other products in certain situations. They, they don't want to use glass or whatever. And honestly, it's not that much different. So it's a couple of pennies more for these companies to make a glass versus a plastic jar and glass is recyclable. So it's much better in that respect. Um, but they don't want to do it right. They, they don't want to lose a couple of pennies every bottle. So you know, honestly, it just usually comes down to money as always, but people just need to think for themselves and be skeptical. If you haven't learned to do that in the last couple of years, now is as good a time as any. And, you know, hopefully you have learned that in the last couple of years. Yeah, well, well said, well said. So we've talked about a lot of the problems, right? Um, you know, we talked about some of the solutions, obviously avoidance, right? Avoidance is one path. Let's talk about some proactive things that we can do. Um, what are what are some? <clears throat> I mean, I, I know on your in your book on your website, you've mentioned 
many things that one can do to improve one's testosterone production, one's hormone production, uh, balance one's hormones. I mean, a lot of ladies out there listening, look, I'm not trying to, a lot of women might think, well, I don't need to raise my testosterone. But as you mentioned earlier, we are seeing these same effects in women. These, uh, these same compounds that are going to mess with men are going to mess with women as well. Um, what are some things that we can do? What are some things that we can consume? What are the, some things that we can actually proactively include in our life? offset this, improve our health, improve our hormone profile. Yeah, I, I recommend the sauna. That's a big one because you actually sweat out estrogen chemicals or sweating period, right? Like at least 10 minutes, three times a week, you got to sweat. And a lot of people aren't sweating at all. So whether that's putting on a ton of clothing and going for a jog or whatever it is, I don't care what you're doing. Ideally a sauna because it's the easiest way and it also has other benefits like heat shock proteins and other things. Um, so that's one thing that's literally been studied crystal clear. You sweat out estrogens. You actually sweat out more than you pee out. So sweat them out. Um, they call them bus studies. If people want to look them up, they're called blood, urine and sweat, B U S bus studies. Like we look up bus studies, phthalates, bus studies, BPA, whatever. Um, and then of course, just, just avoid the estrogens. I mean, get rid of the fragrance nonsense, get rid of all the soy nonsense, get rid of, uh, you know, this, most of the sunscreens, unless it's just zinc sunscreen, get rid of it. Um, you know, uh, the avoidance is huge. The plastics just cut back on the plastics, especially parents that are giving their kids plastic pacifiers and all kinds of nonsense that they're sucking on and chewing on. And, and they did, they've done studies on children's mattresses that are plastic and, and they find a lot of leaching, like to the point where it's cancer causing levels, like they're actually dangerous levels. in some of these cheaper mattresses that are really plasticky. Um, and I don't even, I even bring yeah, my own mattresses. That thing, that kind of freaks me out a little bit. Cause it's like, it's, it's impossible to find mattresses that are not made of, you know, what, whatever mystery, <laughs> mystery, yeah, right, BPA, yeah. phthalate, uh, off gassing chemicals. Um, are you safer with like an older mattress that's hopefully already off gassed more or what, what would you recommend for people who aren't able, I don't know. I mean, mattresses are expensive. Right. These healthy mattresses are, I mean, you're looking at like, you're going to have to get a mortgage to get a, a decent mattress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, put a cotton sheet over it, right? Like make sure you use cotton, not polyester. Because polyester is literally just more plastic on top of plastic. And especially when you travel, like I, I literally bring my own pillowcases. The pillowcase is the most important thing. That's what you're literally breathing on all night. Make sure it's cotton of some type. Or at least make sure it's not polyester. It's crazy to me that people use polyester pillowcases. Um, but yeah, the, the mattress, just make sure it's like reasonably, you know, it's not just pure shiny plastic, I guess. I, I don't know. It's it's hard one to, to figure out. Now, the good news is in the last few years, partly because of my book and partly because of awareness and all this, there's com they're coming out with a lot more mattresses that don't. Just look for bisphenol-free and phthalate-free. If it's phthalate-free, it's going to be good. Like you got to... You got to look for that. There's plenty of alternatives now. They have these corn-based plastics that are, it's called PLA, that are good. Um, you can make stuff, you can make plastics without estrogen chemicals. Just companies don't because, again, it's a few pennies difference. But they're they're waking up to this stuff, especially in the mattress department. Um, let's see, coffee. A lot of people are brewing coffee with plastics. I make cold brew. I do like, I just grind beans in a glass jar and let it sit overnight at room temp. And then the next day I filter out the beans. And then when I make coffee in the morning, I just put the, I just basically heat it up. I like hot coffee, so I don't actually drink it as cold brew, but I heat it up. Oh, so nice, for, nice. For well, worth, I mean, you can also do it old school where it's like, I mean, what we do is we, we grind it fresh. Uh, we just basically boil it in the pot in the water, bring it up to a boil, let it cool off and then filter it through a cotton sleeve. You know yeah. I mean? They, yeah. Here they sell those. Like you get, I mean, it's basically, it's like a wrought iron piece of wrought iron with a little ring and there's a cotton sleeve and then you filter mm -hmm. it through that. Uh, you could use a sock if you want to get real, real cheap <laughs> in old school with it. Yeah. 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 Hemp, they make hemp ones. Yeah. What do you think yeah. people used to use for like, what did people use for mattresses a hundred years ago when there weren't mass produced phthalate based mattresses? What were they making them out of? Straw mostly. It's like Laura Ingalls Wilder. If you read her books, 
moving across the prairie and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they would just use straw and then goose feathers and duck feathers and chicken feathers. You know, when I go duck hunting, I oftentimes pluck all those breast feathers off and we make pillows out of them and stuff. And they would do the same kind of thing. You know, there was thousands of things. Yeah, well, we've got ducks, but we, you know, you butcher maybe maybe 20 a year. So we're not going to be able to make a mattress out of that. Not a mattress, but what you do is you put straw down and you put it on the ground, like outside of the house, it's just littered with duck feathers. So yeah. Then, well, and again, yeah. I don't know if they did the whole thing out of feathers, but they probably did a small layer on top of the straw. Right. And they definitely would make the pillows out of them. Okay. She made a quilt the other day and she stuffed it with wool. Um, nice. You know, nice. I guess if we, if we were to stack up enough wool, eventually, you could make, you know, you could make a mattress, save a wool yeah. for a few years. That might have been a method. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm not totally sure, but they probably did cow hides and all kinds of interesting stuff, you know. And you don't need such a soft mattress too. That's something I've noticed also. I I it's like a better. nice, really firm mattress. And sometimes if I'm, you know, if we go to like an Airbnb somewhere, sometimes I'll find myself just throwing some blankets on the ground and sleeping on the ground because the mattress sucks. Yeah. Um, oh, it happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> That's the number one thing that messes up my back is sleeping on soft mattresses when I travel. And then the light, like I hate it when you go to hotels and things and they have like a light right outside that's pouring through your window and you don't have any curtains or anything and you got a little blind. And the, the light's just coming through. Yeah. So I, I like a big We've something got, to cover it. <laughs> We've had no curtains for the last two years, but I mean, it's with the moonlight's a little different. We don't have light pollution here, but uh, nice. yeah. That's, if, if you stay up late, like I'm, I'll be a little bit later up, I'll be up a little bit late tonight. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that sun's coming out at 6 a.m. no matter what. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of things. And again, my book, I kind of go through all this stuff. What I do in my book for plastic avoid or for estrogen avoidance is I have three plans. I, I call it the gold plan. If you're going to get super extreme, like you've got breast cancer risk or you're a pro athlete or whatever, really go crazy. And then I have the silver plan, which is like, Kind of intermediate and then i have the bronze plan meaning like if, if you're on a budget and you don't want to buy mattresses and all this other stuff like at least here's some of the big hitters so that's what i do in my book for people is i outline those exact types of the scenarios it's complicated i mean it's like you said it's pretty ubiquitous so it does take some thinking and of course on my website like you mentioned also ajconsultingcompany.com i do have a list of products that I personally use because they're pretty affordable. And then they're also very good in terms of estrogen and there's hundreds of different things on there. So it gives people some ideas, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, speaking of which, let me, let me use this as an opportunity to, to shamelessly plug um, <laughs> one of our, one of our awesome sponsors. We, uh, mm -hmm. we, I, I wouldn't be shilling it if I wasn't using it. Big fan of uh, things like Tongkat Ali, uh, mm -hmm. Shilla extract, you know, I mean, uh, if you check out chalk.com, C-H-O-Q.com, chalk.com. And if you use that coupon code BIG50, you're going to get 50% off store-wide, right? I don't know how much longer they're going to be running this code. I keep telling them, let's keep it going. The uh, all, all, all the bigots who watch the show, they, they're they trying to get their testosterone up for the for the dudes. The ladies are trying to, uh, to, to balance their hormones out. So we've got that coupon code BIG50 for all of you. Uh, science denying anti soy uh, bigots out there in the check. Use that code BIG50. You're going to get 50% off store wide. And the uh, Tomcat Ali extract, that one is clinically proven to increase testosterone dramatically. Also, uh, I'm a big fan of the Shilajit extract as well as the, uh, uh, the Chalk Daily, which has the Shilajit uh, extract as well as. Um, uh, uh, several other compounds in there that are known to improve testosterone function. So chalk.com, chhoq.com for some of the highest quality adaptogens. I also, I really like the ashwagandha. I think you might've mentioned this on your website or in your book, ashwagandha also mm -hmm. to improve testosterone production in men. And it's a, it's a natural adaptogen again, that helps your body to adapt to the stressors of daily life. You guys hit up chalk.com, chhoq.com. And use that coupon code um, Big Fifty. But yeah, uh, Doctor Anthony, uh, Doctor Anthony G J. What are some of uh, what are some other things that people can you know like maybe herbal supplements and whatnot that can improve testosterone production, hormone balance? Um, well, I like the brassica family members, like the broccoli and the cauliflower and the whole thing. Uh, 
because they help your liver accelerate estrogen clearance. So a lot of it's just getting the stuff out of your system, you know, and then replacing it, like you said, replacing all the soy and all that nonsense with actual foods that don't have estrogen and have a lot of good vitamins and things for people. Um, I don't think it's that complicated, you know, like it's, it's a matter of just understanding where these chemicals are coming from and getting them out, getting them out, like just avoid them. I think that's the main thing that most people are missing today. Because if you're just, if you're stuffing your face with plastics and then you're taking ashwagandha, it's still not really fixing the problem, right? So you got to start with getting the, the plastics and all the personal care product fragrances and whatever. You got to start by cleaning that stuff up. And then, and then you can, so a lot of people need a lot of uh, supplements to boost their testosterone and all this initially because our, it's taken decades of abuse, right? Our bodies and our receptors and our testosterone levels. And it doesn't, it's not like an overnight thing to reverse all that. Sometimes you see people double their testosterone in six weeks. I get all kinds of testimonials where from men, especially that cleaned up their personal care, they cleaned up their water, they got rid of all the plastic nonsense and their testosterone doubled six weeks, you know? But that's, yeah, that's because that's they're like starting off increase. Um, right? yeah. But they're starting at 300, right? So you're going from 300 to 600. So that's if you're already at 600. 900 to 1800. I exactly. mean, that's going to be, you know, yep. we're, not, we're, not, we're not liver king here. Um, <laughs> exactly. So that's an important caveat because there's plenty of people walking around at 600 or 700, right? And you're, you're not going to expect to double your testosterone, but, you know, you got to start there, I think. Just start with the avoidance and the recognition. So most important thing is avoidance. And uh, let, let's go over again one more time for the uh, for the audience. M biggest categories of things that they should avoid. What are the ones to start with? We don't want to overwhelm everybody. I mean, you start looking around. It's like, oh, my goodness. My my, you know, my computer's made out of plastic. My computer speaker. Right, right, right. Yeah, look at this camera right here. It's 90% plastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What are the what are the easiest ones to start with and the most important ones to start with? Yeah, stuff you're putting on your skin, like lotions and soaps and like personal care stuff you're physically putting on your skin and then stuff you're injecting that's exposed to a lot of plastic, like liquids in plastics. Um, those are the two big categories that I see. Like if people want to get it's the 80 20 principle, you want 80 percent of the benefits for 20 percent of the work, personal care, liquids and plastics, you know, figure those things out. And everything else, just wait until future decisions, right? Like if you're buying kids your toys for your kids, don't get plastic ones, get wooden ones or whatever. Just slowly kind of build up a repertoire of good stuff. But the emergency situation, in my opinion, is the personal care products and then filter your drinking water with like activated charcoal or something like that. And then don't store it in plastic. Simple. How many N95 masks should your kindergartner wear for eight hours a day at school? Oh my gosh! Well, I homeschool. Did you did you know I homeschool? I, I love that. I mean, I, maybe we can get into that a little bit. I mean, when when did you yeah. decide to homeschool? What was it that made you lean towards that? Because I mean, that's something that's real. And we're passionate about that as well. Oh yeah, Definitely. yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised. I mean, no, I home I homeschooled. I was a homeschooler. Uh, my parents started me when I was 13 and I hated it at first because I was on the hockey team and I was the team captain and, <laughs> you know, my whole circle of friends. And then what they did is we replaced hockey with downhill skiing. I'm from Minnesota. So we were skiing twice a week, which is actually kind of super fun and it's super social. And we, we kind of joined this homeschooling group, which had 50 families that were homeschooling. And a lot of them were homeschooling when it was illegal. It used to be illegal back then in Minnesota. And they were doing it anyways. That's how strong, you know, like their moral standards were and their ethics were. No, oh, that must have been great for you as a child too, to be around people who are principled rather than just, you know, spineless shellfish of exactly. people. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of it. Right. Like, so the, you have, you know, honestly, you can teach religion, you can teach stuff that's supposedly illegal in public schools. You can teach morality, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. You can learn how to think. <laughs> so I'm down with the hate speech there, your morality, <laughs> religion. I mean, we're, we're getting, this is, you know, we don't want YouTube to ban us. So I don't want to get thrown in the blue log just yet. Right. No, man, I mean, you can, you can form human beings that are well-rounded in an honest way. 
instead of this nonsense about how you have to be well-rounded by exposing yourself to all kinds of shenanigans and cities and things. And the, the, I think one of the secrets to homeschooling is you have to have a homeschooling group. You know, you got to find a good group of people that are doing it around you. That really helps. It makes it fun, a lot more social interaction. And don't, if you're in a homeschooling group, don't try and do like academic co-ops and stuff. A lot of people do this where they, they, they get together once a week and then they do math or something like that. And it's like, just get together and kick a soccer ball around. Like let the kids just play and have fun and be social. And, and that's what you miss. And that's what they need to do. And outside of like, then they, they're actually better socialized because homeschoolers interact with different age groups and they're teaching each other. And it's, it's a lot better, healthier environment from, the, from the socializing perspective, from the academic perspective, from the, you know, the religion perspective I mentioned. I mean, literally every perspective you can imagine learning to think for yourself is just a giant advantage these days. You have to learn to think for yourself. And that's a big part of education. You have to teach your kids to think for themselves. How do you do that? Well, a lot of times you have to use original source material and like have a lot of discussions and a lot of thoughtful analysis from different perspectives and different angles, rather than just saying, here's the answer spit it back to me. And that's the end of the discussion, right? You got an A or you get an F and there's like, get rid of the silly letter grade nonsense and the silly grades. Like I'm in grade four, I'm grade grade five, get rid of all that. As far as I'm concerned, that stuff doesn't really matter. What matters is that one of the major social engineering things is just segregating people by age. Right. I mean, it's like, you know, you might, you might have a child that's highly advanced in, uh, in in writing and reading and, uh, Mm -hmm maybe uh, a year behind in mathematics and it's like when you you, you constantly are segregating like this it, it seems like that's totally to the detriment of the learning of the child yeah yeah because love of learning is probably the most important skill that you're developing at a young age and people hate learning in these public schools because you're just sitting there staring at a wall and you're bored out of your mind I, i've been there i know what it's like because i'm a big hunter right i love being on the outdoors i like fishing and hunting and I take my kids fishing and hunting all the time. And we go on trips all the time. We travel a lot. Um, and that's another part of it for me is I have the freedom to travel, right? So so I do with homeschooling and I can bring my kids. And um, and they learn a lot more from that than just sitting in a, in a classroom. But yeah, there, like I say, every level that you can possibly imagine, it's worth doing it for for all the different reasons. It's more physical, like you can get up and run around. You don't have to be sitting at a desk. I literally went rock climbing today at the rock climbing gym. I'm in Minnesota, so it's minus 20 degrees. But I go to the rock climbing gym four days a week because it's social. It's fun. Like you're just sitting around chatting with people. And then you're also rock climbing. And my kids are rock climbing, so they're literally working out. And you know what the antidote to sitting in chairs all the time? Sitting in chairs is, is kyphosis, right? It's like your shoulders are hunched for. Rock climbing is pulling back. It's the antidote to sitting. It's literally rowing it's the rowing motion you're pulling and that pulls your shoulders back which is healthy for our to offset kind of our sitting culture so that's another thing i do i try and make sure there's like some physical activity that's healthy that offsets some of the cultural imbalance that we have and you want to have academics that, that offset the cultural imbalances that we have and spiritual learning that offsets the cultural imbalances we have so body mind and soul you know like think of it on those three levels and improve on it from what the public school has develop a love of learning that's the most important thing at a young age because if kids don't want to learn what's the point it it doesn't matter if they if you went through a history book for grade one or whatever and they didn't they're not going to remember that anyways a couple years from now but if they loved it they'll want to do grade two and grade three and grade four and they won't, and they'll still be the same age. You know what I mean? They'll burn through these things and let them burn through. You don't feel like you have to do 10 subjects just because the SAT has it or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. I mean, our, my kids were able to today. I mean, we we've got, we're making silage this week. So we have, you know, this, this massive machine with like a hydraulic press and a, and a, and a big, um, it's almost like a giant wood chipper that you feed all the grass through. And this is the first time we've done this, but it's so cool that they're able to, you know, just stop what they're doing, come outside and and watch us unload the machine and get it ready. And then, you know, I had to go to town and get, uh, get fuel for the machine. So like, we want to come with you, dad. And it's like, you're, you're able to do these things with your children when they're homeschooled. Um, you know, I mean, I, my wife's been able to, to learn a lot about, uh, uh, 
I don't even know what you call it. She, she does sewing, weaving, knitting, all, all the different things. I call them all sewing or knitting. They're all sewing or knitting to me, but she does all these things. And she, you know, my daughter is able to, and she's making clothes for her dolls. We don't buy her dolls. She makes them out of wool and cotton and, you know, clothing scraps. So it's like they're, you, you see these skills develop in the child and you see the child choose which skills to develop, which is, I don't know. To me, it's really impressive. Like, I love to see my five year old just grab a shovel and start digging. And I'm like, dude, like, it's like, that's, that's great form. Like, you dig better than I do. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. little things like that, that you're able to see them do. But where, whereas if, if you're stuck in a public school, mm-hmm. you're, you're at the mercy of the state. You're being raised by the state. You're being your child, being your child's development socially, physically, emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, and spiritually is being driven by state mandated curriculum. And then also, unfortunately, other people's kids who are just going to teach them whatever the heck they want. So it's like, I mean, if you're not going to, if you're not raising your child, the world's going to raise your child. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, um, you know, homeschooling is a huge blessing. Now, of course, not everybody is able to do that. And I I sympathize with you guys, but, you know, we can all, uh, we can all at least, take advantage of the time we do have with our children, right? And then and, and try to move towards being able to help them build real skill sets because they sure as heck aren't getting them in the, the public school system. Right. Yeah, it's 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 a crazy time, right? I mean, but it's an awesome time. I mean, it's it's great that there's so many people homeschooling. I mean, just in the last two years, I'll bet you homeschooling numbers have doubled. I don't know. But I know a ton of people, new homeschoolers that were like, I never thought I would ever homeschool. And here I am, you know, because they've been pushed so far and they finally just jumped off the cliff and started homeschooling, as they would say. But they're happy now. Now they're doing it. Now they're loving it. Right. They're not going to change now. It's amazing. You don't want to go back. And I think I mean, what a great testimony here. Dr. Anthony G.J., who you know has a PhD. He's a doctor. He's not like me on Twitter. I, I have seven PhDs, but those are honorary PhDs that I gave myself. You know, <laughs> but uh, he, he actually has has earned his PhD. Unlike me, who I mean, I earned them, but I did give them to myself <laughs> honorarily. Uh, he's he's got a real PhD. He's uh, you know obviously you know a successful man who has done a lot for himself and his family and for other people in publishing his book Estrogen Generation. Um, and doing the work he does and, and, and helping people to get healthy. And this is, this is the fruits of homeschooling. And I think there's a lot of propaganda against homeschooling. There are a lot of hurdles for people, depending on which state you're in, if you're in the U.S., depending on which country you're in. And a lot of countries, homeschooling is essentially, essentially illegal, like it was yeah. when he was a child. And look, it was illegal when he was a kid. And look how he turned out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, what a fantastic... Uh, testimony to the power of homeschooling and just an afterthought we uh a friend of the channel here uh rachel who i uh, forgive me i forget her last name but uh rachel she's she's on twitter she's based homeschool mom she just did a segment uh with with tucker carlson talking about the dramatic increase in interest in homeschooling and the statistics that you that you kind of mentioned just a minute ago unfortunately i don't recall the exact statistics of the rise of homeschooling in relation to the uh, the implementation of all these so-called pandemic restrictions and uh, health measures and whatnot, but we've seen a huge uptick in parents homeschooling their children across the United States, and I think this is a this is a fantastic thing. This is a great thing. Yeah, yeah, um, it's going to save our culture. I mean, it really is. It's it's the only way to do it where the parents love their, they're loving their kids. Like the teachers don't love the kids, you know, the way the parent would. Um, and you know, the, the, the food is better. I mean, literally like you think about all the different aspects and it's just like, check, 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 check. Homeschooling just continues to come up winning. It's worth making a lot of sacrifices to pull it off. You know, that's my opinion on it because definitely you have to make sacrifices. We do. My parents did. Everybody has to. It's just like it's farming, right? Like what you're doing out there. Um, it's it takes a lot of sacrifice. It's not like some cushy job that you get in a 401k, just stacked up and all this other stuff, you know. And and I I, I quit Mayo Clinic. I don't know if you know that. Like that was probably new since 
we talked last time. I, I worked for Mayo Clinic for three years, and then they started going down this crazy path with the mandates and all the shenanigans. And I'm out there too, so wow. you know sometimes you have to make those. How, kind of how did that happen? Oh, and, and you know the chat just, just from thank you, thank you, chat. It's Rachel Wilson. So if you guys look up Rachel Wilson Tucker Carlson homeschooling on YouTube, mm -hmm. you can see her segment is fantastic. Um, so shout out to Rachel Wilson. She's on Twitter as based homeschool mom. And she is a based homeschool mom. She's awesome. And, uh, you know, um, so yeah, what, what happened with Mayo Clinic? Why did you quit? Uh, did, they, did they kick you out for, for you? Know, did they test your testosterone and realize it was too high? <laughs> no, man. No, no, they were, they had like mask checkpoints. And then, of course, they did the religious exemption for some people that they thought were actually you know, like useful and other employees that they thought were disposable, they wouldn't give them religious exemption. And nobody Absolutely. really contrary uh exception. Oh, yeah. oh for sure. And and I I quit even before that because I saw the light at the end of the tunnel and just saw how authoritarian they were becoming and big brother. They were big brother anyways. Like I did back when I had Twitter, I quit Twitter a while back. Um and just just because yeah, I did too, but it was because they forced me off. They deleted my last. Oh yeah, <laughs> I got a new one. I'm back. <laughs> that's hilarious. Now I quit after they bumped Trump off. I'm just like, you know what? I'm out because this is a bad road to be taken for Twitter, and um, just the kind of censorship and stuff. But but yeah, um, you know, I just saw the light at the end of the tunnel. It's that simple. I. I I've been taken into HR a couple times already at Mayo for like various Twitter posts, just saying grains are bad and all this kind of stuff. Like Mayo Clinic had a poster one time that said, eat more healthy grains and less meat. That was like the title. And it had Mayo Clinic's name on it all. And I just took a picture and put it on Twitter and said, this is nonsense. And they, they brought me into HR for that. And of course, what are they going to do? Like, they're just going to try and scare me. But I've had my disagreements with Mayo Clinic anyways, just doing the conventional medicine nonsense and not really helping people optimize their health and just waiting until people are sick and all this. And, you know, I'm a researcher, so I was a little bit distant from all of that nonsense, but I still was kind of connected to it. And again, just in just the way they were promoting the masking and all this stuff, it was just not going in a good direction. So I just pulled out, you know, there's no reason to, for me to do that. I've got my own company and my, like you said, my book is really successful. I've got a lot of their stuff going on. And like I do consulting for the special forces in America for DNA, you know, I do a lot of DNA consulting. Um, so, you know, I, I don't need Mayo Clinic. I enjoyed what right, I was doing. They, 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 the World Economic Forum, Young Global Leader. Um, yeah, um, yeah, they're in. No, well, no, the, 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 it's funny you mentioned the World Economic Forum. The, the new CEO of Mayo Clinic that's just, you know, been there for like two years now, he's a part of the World Economic Forum. Like, that's an example. Yeah, you didn't get the BuzzFeed article and why that's a good thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy how, uh, you know. It's how amazing how this is all coming to light, right? Like a few years ago, you know, talking about some of these topics, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I don't know, man. It sounds a little crazy to me. But uh, I, I, I think – what we have seen is I think the the intelligent middle ground average person has been forced to reconcile his worldview with mm -hmm. what he's seeing. I mean, you're seeing yeah. guys who are um, kind of habitual fence sitters having to just to maintain their internal integrity, at least recognize a certain degree of mass manipulation that's been going mm -hmm. on. I think uh, Joe Rogan's a fascinating example of somebody who's always mm -hmm. trying to take this kind of middle ground position, you know, but uh, he, a lot of the, 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 the normies, so-called normies are kind of like, they're seeing what's happening. They're seeing the manipulation at the, the political level, the geopolitical level at the, uh, at the scientific level. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think the last two years has been, Kind of like a separating the wheat from the chaff, sheep from the goats kind of a thing. And it's yeah. it's rough because a lot of us are losing our incomes. A lot of us are losing our jobs. A lot of us are, I mean, I, I know a lot of nurses who've lost their job the last mm -hmm. couple of years. It's mm -hmm. or the last, what is it, like eight months. It's absolutely tragic. But at the same time, I'm seeing just like this this beautiful strength and resolve and faith being shown in their actions of not bending the knee, of not uh, of not giving their integrity, their heart, their soul over to to the lie. Yeah. 
Well, and, and just like homeschooling, it takes a sacrifice. If you're living in New York City, get the hell out of there. You know what I mean? Like it takes sacrifice. I get it. You have your grandparents there, or whatever. Get them out too. Like do whatever it takes. South Dakota is a lot cheaper. You know, like move to South Dakota. It's an amazing state. They've never had a mask mandate. They've never had any kind of nonsense. I've been over there lots of times throughout this whole thing. They, there was a, a gas station. I was out hunting antelope in Western South Dakota and I was at the gas station talking to somebody out there. And he was saying that the CDC came in with these six foot social distancing stickers and told him he needs to put them on this floor. And he said, you can go ahead and shove those stickers right up your ass. <laughs> and he said, get out of my store. And that's the kind of people that we have in certain parts of the country. And if you live in a certain part of the, if you live somewhere where you don't have that, don't be afraid to move. You know, I mean, the people that you surround yourself with, just like your friends, you know, it's a really important part of your life and a part of your kid's life and your family and make an effort to make that positive, even if it sets you back in a certain sense, financially or whatever, temporarily in the long term, it's an investment that will pay off, in my opinion. Not everybody can do it. I get it. Not everybody's in an extremely situ an extremely pathetic environment like Los Angeles or New York, where they're really severely you know morally handicapped but some people are and they need to change that you know <clears throat> absolutely absolutely i mean i mean you mentioned that you know suffering a little bit for the truth and i mean you have so many examples of that in the first few centuries of christianity i mean you have thousands of martyrs who at the rational level the world at that time didn't understand what they were seeing they're like why would they, like dude just freaking burn the incense to the gods and you know just just the, just just burn the incense to the idols worship the gods mm -hmm. and uh you'll be good and you know the <laughs> the martyrs are like no <laughs> you know i i believe in christ and uh and, and they were being you know tortured and mm -hmm. It's just it, at the rational level, it made no sense. But the the blessings that came from that, obviously, they weren't worldly blessings. But there's something beyond that. And I think, I think the world falling apart really has pushed a lot of people to at least recognizing some sort of, um, you know, a lot of a lot of norm, normies as we as we so endearingly call them. We don't hate nor when I say normie, I don't hate you guys. It's all good. We we all come from there. But uh, you know, it's uh. A lot of normal people are who never considered, you know, metaphysics who are strict, you know, materialists are starting to realize the limitations of their worldview and realize that like there's a lot more going on here. We're not just uh, we're not just meat suits, you know, uh, flesh flesh uh, suits, uh, you know, clawing around a cold material universe. There's there's more to this, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, suffering and meaning to suffering and and um, and then concepts like truth these uh that that's that's something much more important than uh physical uh advancement right material advancement mm -hmm. monetary advancement so right right I think of years of yeah really separated that out yeah you know it's 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 awakening it's an awakening it should be at least for people Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I want to, I want to respect your time. It's getting a little bit late over here. We have, uh, we've kept, uh, thankfully we've kept it YouTube friendly. Dr. Anthony GJ has <laughs> just, gotten barely. To, just barely, you know, we, we, we didn't say the, uh, I did accidentally. I said, the, I said the J where I said Joe Rogan though. I mean, uh -huh. I mean you're in trouble. Racial slur these days to even say the word Joe Rogan. It's become, you know, that's how, that's how far, uh, the, the dialect has gone. But, um, Dr. Anthony GJ, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find your work? Where can people get your book? Where can people maybe contact you? I mean, you mentioned you do consulting. Uh, where can people contact you without having to join the special forces? <laughs> yeah, I do consulting for normal people every day. Um, AJConsultingCompany.com. That's pretty much where it's at. I, I mean, my book, I would just go to Amazon. Uh, like I say, all the different types, all the different formats in that book are there. And that's where everybody goes anyway so amazon and ajconsultingcompany.com thanks for having me by the way fantastic yeah hey it was really good to have you and um you know actually we have we do have a few got a couple donations here we really appreciate 
y'all who are watching on both YouTube and Rockfin. Remember, uh, share the videos, like the videos. You know, the YouTube, the algorithm. We've we've been on the naughty list. You know, we've we we've done some things. We got some strikes. We you know we spread some. Uh, you know, we spread a little medical misinformation over here every once in a while. You got you to gotta spread a little bit of the medical misinformation if you want to keep your heart and your soul intact. So, you know, if you, if you like the videos, you're going to have to share the videos because the YouTube algorithm will surely not. And, uh, you know, so share those videos um, with, you, with your friends, with your family, with your neighbors. Uh, you know, buy a giant screen and project them in your neighborhood with big speakers, blast them out. Uh, you know, you save them on the floppy disks and, and, and put them in your neighbor's, um, uh, under your neighbor's door at three o'clock in the morning. I think that's a great way to go about it. Um, you know, uh, you know, hack into your, your, your friend's mobile devices, upload this so that it plays constantly on a loop. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how we get to get the word out. You know, we're making transcripts of this on stone tablets and erecting them in your local neighborhood. I think these are great ways of getting the word out these days. We've got to, we've got to be resourceful. So, uh, and then also, you know, sharing the videos, liking the videos, but we do have a couple donations here. Uh, Kelly French uh, throwing a $25 donation via Streamlabs. Thank you very much, Kelly French. I appreciate that. Um, says just supporting your work. Really appreciate that. Thane Michael donated five bucks says, Estro Generation was one of the most informative books about health I have ever read. Thank you, Dr. J. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Comment. Appreciate it. There you go. So you guys, hey, make sure to make sure to get yourself a copy of that. You can get it on Amazon. Um, Enver Attaway, tipping two bucks, says great stuff. Tristan and Dr. J, thank you for that nice tip over there on Rockfin. Uh, Chase says, big fan, everyone. Big old fat tip. Look at that. Chase, number one tipper of the night. Every every once in a while, we get somebody who who, who quite appreciates the stream. Night. Chase is the, the example of a good global citizen. You're going to get, uh, you get like 2,000 gigatons of carbon credits for this tip of 100 bucks over there on Rockfin. Thank you very much, Chase. This big fan, everyone. I'm interested in... <laughs> Um, he says, I'm interested in removing my testicles to improve my singing career. Is chemical castration really that much safer than an old fashioned rubber band? <laughs> this is a homesteading farming question. I've hated my beans and rice for so long. Well, I'm not an expert on that. I have heard that that rubber band old school trick does work on animals. I have yet to castrate any of our livestock. So I don't know. You're going to have to talk to a more experienced, like a proper farmer. Not just a hobby farmer who barely knows what he's doing, like me. Thank you very much, Chase. Uh, Joy, Joy Jackson uh, tipping five bucks because she enjoys the stream. Thank you very much, Joy, and everybody who's watching. Let me see. I think we've got all those. Um, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Well, look at that. We got we got Rachel Wilson, based homeschool mom, in the chat. We have summoned her with her our talk about her segment over there. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the Libertarian Homeschooler on Instagram? No, no. She's my favorite. Follow. The I'll Libertarian Homeschooler. She's super, super shadow banned. But if you type in exactly one word, the, liber the, the Libertarian Homeschooler, she's my favorite in terms of memes. She's got the funniest memes. Just constantly. Well, that's why she's shadow banned. All the good meme pages, you can't even find oh, them out. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. I am almost, I'm, I might have to give up on Instagram. My Instagram has been. You know, oh, yeah. we, we got a we got a They're good clean, 30, we got a good clean thirty nine thousand, and it was like, hey, no, no funny stuff. Never bought followers. Took us years to build it up, yeah. but now it's just like all of a sudden one day they just decided they sent me a message when they did it, but they decided wow. to give me about five percent of the reach as we normally had. So it goes from like, you know, getting a thousand interactions to getting maybe two hundred interactions. I'm just like, man, you guys. Yeah. They, they did that to me too. They did it to me. Yeah. Mine isn't as big feet. as yours, but I don't see your feet anymore. Yeah, I gotta look for you. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's sad. It's pathetic what they're doing. There's no I getting mean, out of it. Once you're in the abyss of shadow banning, it seems like they're just you can't you can't crawl your crawl out. I yep. tried. I went. I went through. I reported you. You know. I report you almost <laughs> every. <time. laughs> I'm reporting all my friends for, That's for hilarious. medical misinformation and uh, <sighs> doesn't work. 
You didn't guys. get any social credit from the Chinese? Oh, no, no, I didn't. I didn't. We'll see. Oh, yeah. We'll see. What, well, you know, once my credit score, once they roll that out, we'll see if I got some <laughs> few gig a ton of, you know, maybe maybe a flight, uh, one 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 flight worth of social credits. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, hey, everybody who's watching, thank you so much. Another shout out to shout out to the sponsor, choq.com, chalk.com, highest quality adaptogens. We've been talking about estrogen. Estro Generation, Dr. Anthony G.J.'s book here, which you can get on Amazon. AJ, uh, what's the website again? AJ Consulting Company. Yeah, AJConsultingCompany.com. You have to spell the whole thing out, unfortunately, but yeah. Awesome. You can find him, AJConsultingCompany.com. Or if you just search Anthony G.J., Dr. Anthony G.J. on Google, I, I know it does come up. Google hasn't figured it out yet. Um uh, they haven't they haven't banned him from Google yet, fortunately. Mm. Uh, <laughs> clinic, uh, he's not allowed in there anymore. But uh, yeah, shout out to our our sponsors over at chalk.com, chalk.com, uh, highest quality adaptogens to help to improve your hormones, to help improve your central nervous system function, and get your body functioning right while it's still legal. So uh, hit them up, and you can use that coupon code Big Fifty for fifty percent off store wide. Let's cross the whole store 50% off, and then you'll be guaranteed 50% more um, more climate change and 50% less 50% less future for Greta Thunberg when you use that coupon code 50 uh, big 50 at chalk.com. So everybody who's watching, thank you so much for sharing the videos, for liking the videos, and uh, make sure to go check out Dr. Anthony GJ's work and his book. Estro Generation, which I love the title. Just the title alone is worth is worth applause. But uh, the book is is much better than the uh, than the title even represents. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony. Again, thanks.